My name is Akhil Hashim. I'm a, uh, a grad student here at Berkeley. Um, and today I'm going to be giving the tutorial for the main talk, which is Searching and Training Parameterized Quantum Circuits in the Presence of Noise by Professor Yangsheng Ding. Um, and, and in particular, I'm going to give an introduction to parameterized circuits and discuss their contemporary applications and the challenges to training them in the NISC era. So um, just a brief outline. Um, first, I'm going to talk about what parameterized quantum circuits are and what they're useful for. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the circuit onsets, the idea of having a guess for your initial circuit and parameterized quantum circuits, and the idea of circuit expressibility, uh, how much of a unitary space your circuit can, can reach, can express. Um, I'll discuss how we actually compute gradients for parameters in, in PQCs. I should mention, um, sometimes they're also called variational circuits. Um, I'll discuss what are contemporary issues facing the trainability of, of parameters in, in parameterized quantum circuits. And finally, um, I'll, I'll pose some open questions in the field so that we can hopefully use these for a discussion later. So firstly, um, what are parameterized quantum circuits? Well, um, as most of you know, um, we use quantum circuits to perform some unitary operation on qubits. So I start my qubit in the ground state, I evolve its state using a unitary operator, and I'm left with a new state psi. Well, parameterized quantum circuits are circuits that are composed of gates with variable free parameters. So say my entire unitary operator is some block, I can break this down into layers of unitary operators or cycles, kind of moments in time, or perhaps I can break this down in further into gates that are parameterized, gates that are, that are not parameterized. In any case, this list of variable free parameters can come from a variety of sources. It can come, for example, from the phase implied by a continuously parameterized C phase gate, or it can come from any of the free parameters in the U3 decomposition of a single qubit gate. So it could come from the rotation angle or one of the phase parameters in this gate. In any case, in any case, when I measure this, this circuit in some basis, is there a question? Because I was someone a Monday night. I lost my. Hey, can you um, can you mute your microphone if you haven't muted yet? No, not this one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm muted for him. Um, in any case, when we measure this circuit in some basis, we obtain an objective function of these parameterized uh, of these parameters, and this is just an expectation value with respect to some basis. And so this 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 objective function provides a cost for this parameterized circuit. Either this parameter is is um, accurate and we obtain an accurate representation of the expectation value, or, it does, or it's not accurate, and we have some costs associated with these parameters. So um, there are many applications of parameterized quantum circuits, everything ranging from quantum chemistry and finding ground states of quantum systems, to machine learning, to solving combinatorial optimization problems. Probably the, the flagship example of uh, variational quantum algorithms, or which use parameterized quantum circuits, is the variational quantum eigensolver. And this, this basic structure, this workflow, really applies to many of the problems that are going to be discussed today. So typically, you start with some qubit Hamiltonian H. You choose an onsets for your circuit. And I'll discuss this briefly in the next slide. You choose some initial parameters, initialization of your parameters in your parameterized quantum circuit. You use this parameterized quantum circuit to evolve your qubits. You apply some basis rotation operators, and you measure an expectation value. And again, this expectation value here is my cost. I then will pass this to some classical optimizer. I'll obtain a new set of values, and I'll repeat this process until I've converged, until I've minimized this expectation value. Another common example is quantum machine learning. Um, if you're familiar with machine learning, you know that you want to train the weights and biases of some matrix to correctly classify some state, some input vector, or some problem. And so we do similar things with parameterized quantum circuits. We utilize the freedom in the parameters to correctly represent some state or correctly predict some outcome. We pass it again through some optimizer where we, we can analyze the landscape, compute gradients, and we update the parameters. A final example I'll give is something known as the quantum appro approximate op optimization algorithm, or QAOA. And this is often used for combinatorial optimization problems like, um, like max cut or, or the traveling salesman problem. And, and the structure is a bit different, but the idea is still the same. I have layers of parameterized gates 
And these, these gates are parameterized by a single number or a single parameter, gamma one, alpha one, gamma two, alpha two. And I repeat this process and the deeper the circuit gets, um, the better it can approximate a problem. So um, as you see in this, this upper, hand, upper right hand corner, um, there's an importance in this initial onslaughts you choose for your circuit because different problems require different circuit architectures. And this is very analogous to classical machine learning where you may have a problem that you wanna use a simple multi-layer perceptron or a convolutional neural network or a, or a recurrent neural network. And broadly speaking, um, an onslaught can fall into one of two categories, either it's problem inspired or problem agnostic. A difference between these two, for example, is given in this example up here, right? On the left-hand side, I have what's called the unitary coupled cluster onslaughts. And on the right-hand side, I have what's called the hardware efficient onslaughts. On the left-hand side, there is some symmetry in your problem that allows you to simplify your circuit structure. And here I'm left with a single parameter, the Z rotation gate right here. Now, on this other side, perhaps I don't know what structure of circuit I need. And so instead what I do is I create a, a completely parameterized quantum circuit. Sometimes it's called the hardware efficient onslaughts, but it's really a problem agnostic onslaughts. And the idea is that you have you know, a number of qubits and you initialize these qubits using a completely parameterized single qubit gate. I then interleave this with a layer of fully entangling gates and to leave that with a layer of single qubit and um, parameterized gates. And I repeat this process many times for as, as long a depth as I need. And so this introduces the idea of circuit expressibility, which states the degree to which a circuit, a parameterized quantum circuit can uniformly explore a unitary group. So as an, as an example for two qubits, there exists something known as the, the KAK or CACD composition for SU4 gates. It turns out that any SU4 gate can be expressed with a circuit of this form. This involves three C naught gates and fully parameterized single qubit gates. So this circuit right here is expressive enough to completely explore SU4. Um, now, as I stated a couple slides ago, um, we have a hybrid quantum classical loop. And in some senses, these loops depend on some level of classical optimization. And so the question becomes then, how do we determine partial derivatives of our variational parameters? There are various ways, but um, the most fundamental way is what's known as the parameter shift rule. Um, and the idea here is I'm trying to obtain some gradient of F for a given parameter theta for all the parameters in my circuit. And you can do this by taking the difference between two circuits or two, two objective functions. So again, as a reminder, this objective function is just an expectation value. And briefly, I'm gonna draw an analogy with a classically computable function, and that's just the sine of X. So if my function is the sine of X, it turns out that the gradient of this function can be expressed, you may already know this, in the following form. I can compute the sine of x plus pi over two. I can compute the sine of x minus pi over two. I can take the difference between the two of those, divide by two, and this gives me the derivative of sine of x with respect to x. So without proving this to you, I'm gonna state that you can do the exact same thing in parameterized quantum circuits. I can compute my objective function at theta plus pi over two, at theta minus pi over two, take the difference, and I get this partial gradient of f of theta with respect to theta for every theta in my circuit. Okay, so I didn't prove this, but I can give you a nice example that demonstrates this fact. So consider here what I have, just a toy example, um, some, uh, some experimental data that de nicely demonstrates the parameter shift rule. And so consider like my initial qubit state line here on the block sphere. So this theta is like an initial onsaults, and say I actually wanna to converge to um, the excited state, to the, to the south pole of the block sphere. So my initial onsaults is theta, and it's a poor onsaults. And so what I do is I measure the state in the Z basis and I obtain some expectation value. And so now I have some function of theta. So what I can do is I can evaluate the same thing at theta plus pi over two. I can evaluate it at theta minus pi over two. I can compute the difference between the two of these. And then using gradient descent or some more advanced optimization procedure like Adam or, or any other optimization, I can subtract this gradient from my parameter and obtain a new objective function here, moderated by some step size. And as, as you'll see, these, these steps um, get a bit larger each time. That's because I'm using Adam, which is a momentum-based optimizer. 
And so I can compute that I can I can continue this process all the way until my state points at the, the south end of the block sphere. And at this point, if I measure plus pi over two and minus pi over two, the expectation value is, is zero in both those cases, and my gradient will therefore be zero. And so I nicely converge down here. Now, importantly, um, this method only requires you to have one quantum circuit. You have one quantum circuit and you um, evaluate it twice. Uh, and you have to do this for each parameter in your circuit. So if, if you have a very um, highly expressive circuit with many parameters and also many basis states or many poly strings in your Hamiltonian, this can become a bit cumbersome. And there are more sophisticated methods of doing this with many parameters. Okay, so we have a basis now of, uh, of, of how we train uh, parameterized quantum circuits. So here's an example that you'll see in the next talk. Um, this example is uh, a quantum neural network for image classification. So you might wonder, how do we actually classify images in a quantum circuit? The idea is that we can take, we can take, these, we can take these pixels in, in an image and we can encode them um, we can code them in single qubit gates. We have some mapping, we can encode, basically this is our encoding layer. Um, and so this is like a basis preparation or an encoding layer where we take this image and we encode it in our circuit. The next step will be training our quantum circuit just like we train um, classical neural networks. And again, we have some parameterized quantum circuit. Maybe you have some specific onsots, maybe you don't have a specific onsots, um, but you wanna be able to train the angles, the, the parameters in here, to correctly represent or correctly predict whatever the label is for this image. To do this, we measure the Z basis and we can obtain um, classical bit strings. And finally, just like we do in classical machine learning, we may pass these bits th bit strings through some activation function like a soft max to obtain a probability for each class. So the workflow is very similar. It's just we're using a quantum circuit to encode the information instead of uh, a classical matrix. So what are some contemporary challenges um, with parameterized quantum circuits? Um, I've talked a bit about problem agnostic versus problem inspired on SATSA. Um, it turns out that this notion of expressibility has some issues because it can lead to flat cost landscapes. Uh, and this is what's known as a barren plateau. It turns out that this partial gradient of F of theta with respect to theta vanishes exponentially with system size. So I have this diagram to the right that nicely demonstrates this. Consider this outer circle, which represents the entire space of some unitary group. And consider these kind of sub-circles, which represent some problem, sub subsystem B, subsystem A. And within these sub-circles, there's a nice cost landscape and you can correctly converge to a minimum. Depending on the expressibility of my quantum circuit, I may only have access to some subspace of this entire unitary group. This would be like a, a, um, a problem-inspired onsots. You may have a, a, a access to a space that can converge within one subsystem, but not within another subsystem. However, now, now assume I have a problem agnostic onsots. So I have access to a very large space in the unitary group. Well, the cost landscape out here is gonna be extremely flat until you get to one of these areas and then it'll, it will converge nicely. And so the way to understand barren plateaus is that it's a function of both a problem agnostic onsots and random initialization. If I randomly initialize my parameters and I end up over here, I will need to search over an exponentially large landscape to find the global minimum. And this exponential scaling is a function of sequence or of circuit depth and circuit size, number of qubits. Um, another contemporary challenge is gate noise and decoherence. Um, and I should mention, I'm not talking about gate errors. Gate errors are typically systematic, like unitary errors or coherent errors. And, and parameterized quantum circuits are actually robust to systematic errors because these systematic errors can be built into the parameters and they can be accounted for. I'm talking more about gate noise, like stochastic Pauli noise or anything that you can't account for. And this leads to the notion of noise-induced barren plateaus. So if I consider you know, a shallow depth circuit with a few number of qubits, I may have a nice clean landscape. But as I make the circuit longer in depth and add more qubits, I add more noise and I'm more susceptible to decoherence. And this leads to what's known as the shallow gorge phenomenon. 
I shrink my minimum basically. And the reason, the way you can understand this is that cost functions are minimized by pure states, but incoherent noise and decoherence reduces state purity. And so it flattens these extrema. And it means you can never actually find the true minimum. Finally, I'll just mention finite sampling noise. We take a finite number of shots for each poly string in your Hamiltonian. But if you're being impacted by noise-induced barren plateaus, you actually need an exponentially large number of shots to resolve gradients in these regions. And so this is, this is a problem that is, is actually both these problems are quite difficult to overcome, especially in the NISC era where we have such noisy quantum processors. So finally, uh, I'll end with just some open questions. So the first being, um, how do we solve the problem of barren plateaus? And can we solve the problem of barren plateaus? Um, I think this is a really important problem because if we ever want to achieve quantum advantage, um, we will need to be able to address this issue. And as an example, um, a recent result showed that barren plateaus are not observed in quantum convolutional neural networks. Um, and and th these, these neural networks are basically tree-like structures where the number of parameterized gates gets smaller at longer circuit depths. I think we need more experimental demonstrations and theoretical exploration of barren plateaus to truly understand whether or not we can achieve some quantum advantage with variational quantum algorithms. Also, how does one best choose uh, the proper onsets and parameter initialization for any given problem? I know for me personally, this is not an intuitive problem. I think for many people, this is not intuitive. And that's why these, these problem agnostic circuits are really enticing because you don't know how to structure your circuit. So you start with something expressive enough to solve the problem. But when you do that, you leave yourself open to other issues. Also, to what extent can we design noise resilient PQCs? This is the topic of today's talk, so I won't go into this any further. To what extent can error mitigation strategies be used to improve estimates of expectation values? And by error mitigation strategies, I mean like zero noise extrapolation or probabilistic error cancellation or virtual, virtual distillation. Some recent theoretical results showed that error mitigation can actually worsen or not improve trainability because you take resources put somewhere and you place them into the trainability aspect and there's some exponential scaling there as well. So I think more work needs to be done to understand to what extent these error mitigation strategies can be used and whether or not they can help us. Can changing the structure of noise or errors in parameterized quantum circuits improve trainability? And by changing the structure, I mean, utilizing something like randomized compiling or poly frame randomization, where you tailor arbitrary Markovian errors into some error channel, for example, a stochastic poly channel. So if we, can control, if we can control the structure of the errors, can this help us design circuits that can be trained more efficiently? And finally, can variational quantum algorithms provide near-term quantum advantage, specifically in the NISC era? There's, there's a lot of promise in many different fields, but it's an open question. Can we, can we get past this issue of barren plateaus and, and trainability to actually provide some level of quantum advantage? So with that, um, I'd like to introduce the, the main talk of the day, um, Searching and Training Parameterized Quantum Circuits in the Presence of Noise um, by Yongcheng Ding. And Yongcheng is a pro assistant professor of computer science at Yale University. His research focuses on quantum computer architecture and algorithms. Ding has developed novel techniques for quantum error correction, quantum memory management and optimization at the quantum classical interface. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago and his bachelor's of science from Carnegie Mellon University. And the majority of his talk is gonna focus on these two papers. So definitely go and check these out. Uh, and with that, I will end and, and Yongcheng, you can, you can begin. Okay, thanks. It uh, took me a while to uh, unmute myself. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Akel, for the very crisp tutorial and very uh, ties very well to, to what I'm going to talk about today. So that's, uh, I, I really like this format, in fact, to have this type of uh, tutorial right before the talk, because now I, now I can just jump right into the, the meat of the talk. So thank you. Uh, let me take a moment to share my screen and see if that'll work. Uh, oops, system preferences, okay. Um, okay, I'll have to uh, 
quit uh, Zoom and rejoin so that I have permission to, uh, to share screen with my desktop. I'll be back. Can someone make me the co-host so that I can share? Hold on, you uh, who's that? Who's in charge here? The host. Let's see. Can you can you try now? Let me try. Yes, yes, I can. Okay, okay great. Sorry for the technical pickup. Um, so, can you all see my screen and the presentation mode? Yes. Good. Good. Okay. Okay. Great. So, uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me and. Uh, thanks, Akel, for the really amazing tutorial on this topic. Um, I'm going to dive deep into one of the uh, recent projects that I'm very excited to share with you guys uh, in searching and training parameterized quantum circuits in the presence of noise. So uh, this is a collaboration between multiple groups across uh, several institutions from MIT, Yale, uh, UT Austin, and U Chicago. If there's anything good coming out of this talk, that's that's because the hard work by my amazing collaborators. So uh, just a, a system here, and uh, I just want to begin by saying it's exciting time for quantum computing. Uh, quantum technology is transforming a wide range of computing applications, and in particular, a parameterized quantum circuit is considered one of the promising candidates to enable these applications. Some areas of active research spans from uh, numerical analysis to simulations of nature, and recently to uh, machine learning tests using these type of parameterized quantum circuits. And the hope of uh, the hope is that with the tool of parameterized quantum circuits, we can either theoretically or empirically show that quantum computer can perform some computational tasks that are uh, potentially intractable from conventional digital computer. This is a notion of quantum advantage. And, uh, but uh, the key question I want to ask is, can uh, parameterized quantum circuits bring you this type of uh, uh, quantum advantage, in particular, uh, can we show empirically uh, this is uh, uh, possible? Um, there, are there are several uh, outstanding challenges before we can reach practical scale uh, uh, sort of uh, quantum advantage demonstration. Um, there are some emerging radical breakthroughs which hint at where we may find such quantum advantage. And, and I know some of the uh, talks in this colloquium series is also addressing this. Um, but we have yet to see strong empirical evidence that practical, the uh, parameterized quantum circuit or PQC in short is good at learning tasks in practice. Uh, when I say in practice, I mean deploying them on today's or near term quantum hardware. And there are several challenges. And today I'm going to uh, try to uh, Today, I'm going to talk about how parameterized quantum circuits can be adapted to these challenges, uh, constraints in these challenges to um, just to sort of, sort of speed up or facilitate research on PQC. So the first challenge is system size. Uh, quantum computers have a limited number of qubits from tens of qubits to hundreds of qubits at the moment. The small system size makes it difficult to execute large quantum programs simply because they won't fit. 
Um, and the second challenge is quantum systems are noisy. The error rates of quantum computers can be very high. For example, in this table, uh, superconducting devices in the first row have an average gate error rate of 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4. So uh, an error would likely occur for every few thousand operations. And qubits have a limited lifetime too, typically just enough time to perform tens of thousands of operations. And other technologies in this table uh, have similar error rates. Things are improving, but th these errors together will severely limit the success rate of a uh, uh, quantum program when we deploy them on the hardware. The third challenge, which is very of interest to uh, system research like me, researchers like me, uh, the, uh, is the software control complexity. Uh, programming quantum circuits today is like programming uh, assembly language in the 1960s, where we write down and optimize a sequence of gates. But the good news is that unlike the 1960s, now we can use the best classical resource like high performance computer or servers, clusters to simulate, compile, and optimize the quantum programs. Um, uh, but the bad news is that even with the help of supercomputers, we cannot faithfully describe highly complex entangled quantum systems. So uh, we ask, can we as uh, computer architects help? Uh, how can we design tools and techniques to improve the efficiency and uh, noise resilience of quantum circuits um, so that we can save some manpower or engineers to, to manually design things uh, uh, to adapt to these hardware. So in order to do that, uh, we need some understanding about the noisy hardware that uh, we have at hand. Well, suppose we have a parameterized quantum circuit we like to test on the left, and we have a few options of quantum hardware, say from IBM. Uh, each quantum hardware has a different topology and error rates for the gates and measurements. Uh, we would expect our quantum circuits to perform well on machines with better error rates or, and or denser connectivity in the topology. Um, but in reality, perhaps my quantum circuit works at none of them because they are too noisy, all too noisy, and my circuit is just not optimized to, to these hardware. Uh, and it's very hard to train if it's a parameterized quantum circuit due to these very random uh, noise. So it is very unsatisfying if I need to manually change my onside design, which I carefully crafted uh, for, for a task, to every hardware or for every computational tasks or for every data set that I need for learning. Uh, it will cost a lot of, as I said, uh, manpower and uh, time to, to uh, optimize this. And we want to optimize this process. So uh, before I talk about our techniques for efficiently searching and training parameterized quantum circuits, I want to first put this work in context with several theoretical findings that I think are super interesting. Um, in particular, when do we need to search and train uh, parameterized quantum circuits? Well, Akel has, uh, has already motivated this very well. Um, and let me take some examples in VQE and uh, quantum machine learning. In this task, the design space for a good parameterized quantum circuit model or an onset is very large, and it's still very much open in finding a good onset model with guaranteed performance, for example, uh, with very nice gradient descent dynamics. Um, in VQE, we have onset designs to adapt to constraints in hardware, to uh, problem-specific onsets. And in quantum machine learning, we have these theoretical insights from uh, uh, from kernel methods and this new emerging uh, quantum tangent kernel uh, kernels uh, into which design has nice behavior um, 
For example, the recently uh, developed quantum tangent kernels goes beyond the conventional kernels and uh, tries to characterize the gradient descent behavior of parameterized quantum circuits in a wide, deep circuit regime. Um, and these insights, these theoretical insights, will motivate us to look for interesting parameterized quantum circuit design. Um, for example, at mile depth regime, where we can uh, hope for practical deployment as well as good expressive power to uh, um, to, to your learning tasks. So um, our work complements those radical insights and presents techniques to improve the efficiency and robustness of these parameterized quantum circuits as well as their variants. So present, uh, we can present um, empirical evidence to validate the theoretical models. Um, and we can do so by looking at novel sort of onstar constructions and parameterized uh, parameter optimization methods um, that could together potentially go beyond the conventional kernel methods, let you play with different novel designs. And I just want to highlight that uh, uh, I think it's very important to consider both the onstar construction and the parameter optimization as a, as a joint process for optimization. Um, the reason I uh, think they should be considered together, um, either when you manually design your onset or developing a software or, or a, a optimizer to do that automatically, uh, is really because I, I really like this analogy that in variational quantum algorithms that the onstar circuit or construction is like the car uh, that you can drive. And uh, training the parameters for the onstar is like training a good driver to drive the car. And we need both a good car and a good driver to, to navigate through, through this uh, noisy uh, quantum space. So. Uh, I, I really like this analogy that the road to quantum advantage is really is a really bumpy one. And if we are to use parameterized quantum circuits to do this, we got to be uh, prepared with the best possible car that we can uh, design and a very well-trained driver uh, for that car. So uh, you will uh, see that the theme of the research that we do is to really think about software and hardware co-design and application co-design, thinking about what works better uh, as a whole. So um, uh, let, me, let me get started and, and try to use this for motivation to, um, to highlight the significance or importance of, uh, of design noise resilient uh, parameterized quantum circuits. So a common design space for a parameterized quantum circuit is the parameter space. Uh, we have some hints that uh, moderately more parameters would increase the expressive power of PQC, uh, parameterized quantum circuits, without sacrificing trainability. Uh, but we do not see that in practice. When we deploy a large model or a relatively large model on hardware, it quickly becomes prohibitive to deploy um, despite the theoretical advantages in expressive power. So there is a huge gap between the theoretical predictions and the empirical results. The performance of an onsite will increase, but saturates with increasing parameters theoretically, which is the blue uh, line. And uh, in practice, when we deploy and measure the accuracy of a task, for example, the performance degrades significantly. Um, furthermore, uh, under the same parameter number, the, uh, if you're looking at a column, the uh, variance of the measured accuracy is uh, uh, very high um, uh, because of uh, uh, different onsets in that space. Um, and I want to highlight that there is a peak um, in this, in this uh, uh, yellow line which we want ideally want to reach. Um, if you have a 
uh, outside design and you have the hardware that you want to deploy. So uh, we would ideally like to grow and shrink the onsite model uh, in the context of number parameters, for example, uh, to really fit our model onto the hardware better. Um, in other words, climb back up to the top of the peak in, in the performance. Um, and uh, a simple attempt is, the first attempt is to compress the circuits, right? Um, in other words, if you remove some of the parameter, uh, parameterized gates, for example, uh, uh, you can re reduce the number of gates and uh, uh, intuitively that will reduce the error that uh, uh, your gate uh, imposes to the circuit. This sometimes works, but not always. You are very likely to end up uh, cutting through to a very low accuracy on site because of the very high variance. Um, so can we compress the circuit more strategically? Well, if you are familiar with the pruning and fine tuning of neural network models, uh, the solution is pretty straightforward. You can perform iterative gate pruning and interleave with fine tuning uh, to update the parameters after you remove some of the gates, to recover the accuracy. That's the advantage of having a parameterized quantum circuits. You can uh, always adjust your parameters to, to uh, recover some of the performance. Um, uh, so in the figure, Schematically, it looks like you have a, a staircase going upwards to the peak. Um, you first prune some of the gates so that you have fewer parameters. You might expect some uh, improvement because of reduced gates, but uh, it's hard to say. But if you fine tune the parameters for that reduced uh, circuit, compressed circuit, you can improve the uh, performance um, at that parameter uh, number and then keep going. So this is a, an idea of using iterative gate pruning to, to, to try to improve the performance of a onset um, on the hardware. But you can see this is a, still a very sort of fine grain uh, optimization that we can do to the circuit. Uh, I want to ask, well, can we allow larger design space um, in search for a good onset or parameterized quantum circuits. Um, now we're going to introduce our approach to automate the process of onsite search or uh, PQC search. Um, it has two components to it, as I mentioned. The first one is circuit construction uh, design. And the second is how to train and optimize the parameters associated with it. So, uh, uh, let me motivate this, uh, this um, uh, searching mechanism first using a naive approach. So ideally, we want to search for a good parameterized quantum circuits. It will be great if we have a ranking of the performance of, of several parameterized quantum circuits and, and try to identify the good ones. A naive approach to, to uh, uh, have an estimation of the ranking is to uh, iterate over um, some of the design spaces. So iterate over the devices um, with different noise parameters. You uh, iterate over some search episodes uh, in search for good circuits. And then for each episode, you will need to train the circuits to uh, train the parameters within the circuits to their best performing ones. And, uh, and having those updated parameters, you are able to compare if a circuit is better than the other. So uh, uh, if you find a good circuit, that's great. Well, this whole process is too expensive to do because you are uh, literally training all the possible parameterized quantum circuits you want to uh, in your design space. And um, it's just not affordable. We have a, a so to speak, limited budget for training. Um, so 
an efficient, a more efficient way to do this kind of search is uh, really to construct some model or a circuit that can help you estimate the ranking. So here we introduce a super circuit search approach where the super circuit, in fact, is just a estimator, a, a, a circuit, a parameterized circuit that will help you estimate the ranking of, of its sub circuit. And I'll clarify the relationship between our super circuit and the sub circuits. But here, these sub circuits that the super circuit is in charge of are the circuit candidates or parameterized quantum circuit candidates that you want to compare and rank. Um, we want to decouple the search and uh, training process from the training process. So uh, uh, after all, you only need to uh, perform training for the super circuit once. And then within that super circuit, the sub circuit will be sampled from this trained super circuit. And you just compare the sampled uh, circuit candidates from your uh, super circuit. So this is a, a technique inspired by neural architecture search. And you will, if you are familiar with the supernet and subnet construction, um, and this has a strong flavor in there. Um, at the end, I'll highlight things that we learned in uh, using these techniques in the context of parameterized quantum circuits. Some techniques work, some don't. So it's very important that we, uh, we uh, take the working techniques. So um, uh, I'm going to dive deeper into the construction of super circuit, as well as the uh, way to search for sub circuit within the super circuit and how to train the sub circuit uh, as the last step. But, but before I uh, go into the technical details are, I think it's a, I was, I was encouraged to insert some uh, time in the middle for allowing questions. So if there's any questions for the first part of the talk, I'll, I'll try to go over some of them. There is a hand raised. Daniel? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, um, my question is that how do you like um, train this network? Do you still use the parameter shift rule to derive the derivatives, or do you just use some like stochastic gradient descent? Right. So yeah, so this uh, tool that I'm going to introduce is very flexible. In fact, you can. Uh, we have implemented uh, both the uh, parameter shift rule um, using quantum hardware for inference and training, um, or you can, uh, as well as using uh, gradient descent for, uh, for, for training um, or simulation of the quantum circuits uh, implemented um, on classical computer to, to do the inference and training. And we'll talk about the scalability of these, these uh, problems, these uh, techniques. I think there's another question from Meng. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so my question is, uh, the ultimate goal for here is to show some quantum advantage of a parameterized quantum circuit. So what is the what is, what is your metric to show the quantum advantage here? Right, right. So uh, uh, this talk doesn't um, uh, define a metric for this uh, quantum advantage. Um, our goal of this work, in fact, is uh, more limited in scope, which is just to facilitate a, a larger design space so that we can um, deploy some of the emerging quantum parameterized quantum circuit models to hardware and, and see if they, we can see empirical evidence that uh, they work well. They work well. Um, in, in classical computing, we have these deep neural networks working very well empirically, and we have some uh, ideal of uh, 
uh, uh, quantum tangent kernel, for example, uh, sorry, uh, neural tangent kernel to uh, characterize the behavior of these uh, deep neural networks. Um, uh, but in quantum, the case for quantum uh, parameterized quantum circuits, we don't even have a empirical tool that works well. So I think it's uh, um, important that we also look at the practicality of implementing those emerging uh, exciting parameterized quantum circuit models. Um, uh, so this tool does not directly uh, prove that you have quantum advantage, but I think it's a nice tool to have to facilitate design in that direction. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me defer uh, other questions to the end of the talk, but uh, um, uh, feel free to put into chat um, at any time, and I think at the end we'll get to them. Um, so let me get to the remaining of the talk, and um, I'll go through some of the technical details with varying details. Um, so uh, in particular, I want to highlight some of the techniques that I think work particularly well in the context of quantum circuits. Um, many of the techniques you will see analogy in classical neural networks, um, but, uh, but I think uh, important uh, uh, remark that I want to make is that not all techniques can pour well, but some techniques pour well, uh, particularly well, uh, surprisingly well, and I want to highlight those. Okay, so uh, first about the construction of super circuits. This is also the first step in, uh, in our tool. Um, so say uh, from some theoretical study, we know that some quantum circuits, some parameterized quantum circuits uh, have the uh, potential to be a promising uh, trainable circuit. And we call that a basic block. And let's say you can construct a basic uh, block in this circuits. And these boxes are parameterized quantum gates. Um, they have their corresponding parameters. Um, the goal here is to see if we can sort of uh, 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 enlarge the design space allowed by these basic blocks um, uh, by, for example, concatenating multiple of these basic blocks into multiple layers uh, to increase the expressive power of this uh, quantum circuits and maybe potentially interleave with uh, data encoding. Um, and and this, this is uh, one of the um, sort of uh, promising approach to, to uh, encode information into quantum circuits. Um, but the goal of this tool is to try to design the parameterized quantum circuit component and see if uh, uh, we can make that noise resilient so that it's easier to deploy on hardware. But the goal is to rank the relative performance of candidate circuits. So what are the candidate circuits? Uh, in this super circuit construction, well, it's really just uh, a subset of the gates from this super circuits. Um, and we will talk about the constraints, the conditions of how to define the subset. Um, but it, for, for now, you can think of this as a, a multiple blocks of these uh, basic structures. And if you pick some of the gates from that set, uh, base, basic structure, uh, and, and look at the post circuit, this is your candidate circuit. And we call that a sub-circuit because it's a subset of the parameterized gates. Um, and each of the block you will see has a sample gates uh, showing on the bottom. Um, I want to also highlight that those, those gates share uh, the parameters to the super circuits. Um, uh, this is the, the uh, key to saving some of the training overhead for, uh, for each circuit candidates. So um, in other words, circuit sub-circuits sample from the super circuits inherit some of the parameter uh, from the super circuits. And the goal again is to estimate the rank of these candidate circuits accurately uh, while 
ensuring that fast training uh, can be done in this very large design space. So um, how can we train a supercircuit within a very small budget? Um, we need to be very strategic about how to define our sub-circuit enabled by the super circuit. Uh, uh, for one, we need to prioritize training on uh, some of the parameters over the others. Uh, if you know, some of the gates can be, um, some of the gates are sort of uh, more important than the others. Um, but it's also uh, the case that uh, uh, the reason that we do this type of uh, uh, sampling based training method where we only sample a subset of the gates to, to train is really uh, because it's very difficult to train a dense super circuit all at once. There are too many parameters, just the training overhead, as well as the uh, uh, fidelity of this uh, inference will be low if the circuit is too uh, dense. So we designed this sampling-based training method where we only train a subset of the parameters at a time. And we do that iteratively, iteratively for uh, different subsets. Um, at the same time, freeze some of the parameters for uh, for the remaining gates that you didn't pick in your subset. Um, a downside of this is, the, is that uh, this type of sampling from super circuit will increase the variance of the pr prediction accuracy at the end. Um, that will severely hinder how you can train this super circuit directly. Um, so we have to constrain the sampling space very well. And uh, one approach to do this is to prioritize some of the training so that we can stabilize the uh, super circuit training process. Um, so we want to constrain how you pick the subset from the circuit in this iteratively, in this iterative training uh, process. Um, for example, we can constrain by looking at only the, uh, uh, by sampling only the gates on the first few qubits um, in the basic block, and always sample the front few qubits at a time. Um, so uh, this will allow the low index qubits to be prioritized. So gates on those low index qubits will have, uh, will be, uh, much well trained. At the same time, we also want to uh, constrain the layers that you sample. Say, say you want to concatenate multiple layers, um, but we want to uh, get as deep as possible under the constraints that you can do that with high fidelity on a noisy hardware. Uh, try to milk the hardware as much as you can so we want to prioritize on the high depth uh, subcircuit that you sampled. So uh, we want to make parameters in the large index blocks very well trained. So we designed this uh, progressive shrinking mechanism where the deep subcircuit are trained more, many more times uh, than these shallow circuits. Uh, because these deep circuits has more expressive power, and if you can make those work, it's worthwhile. So uh, uh, this is some of the technique that uh, works in uh, uh, trying to stabilize the quantum circuit uh, training. But um, we also want to, as I mentioned in the previous slides, uh, restrict the difference between two consecutive sampled subcircuits so that the whole training process um, does not have sort of uh, rough jumps uh, so that it's very hard to train. Um, this is done by restricting how you can, how you sample two consecutive uh, subcircuits into steps. Um, we constrain the number of layers that you can alter uh, every step. So altering five layers is not allowed, but if you are altering the uh, number of gates sampled in only a very few layers, then that's allowed. 
So having this very uh, uh, carefully designed restriction on the sampling of the subcircuit, we can have a nice, nicely performing set of subcircuits sampled from the supercircuit. Um, before I talk about the quality of these sample circuits, uh, let me just finish by finish uh, this part of the algorithm by saying the next step is to compare the performance of each sample subcircuits um, and really look at their performance on a target hardware. For example, you have an IBM machine with five qubits, then you need to uh, uh, design the qubit mapping for the circuits onto those qubits cub uh, um, uh, for your subcircuits and then compare the performance. For example, this first subcircuit might have a high fidelity, then you pick that one. Uh, and this is the candidate circuits that you think are adaptive to the noise and ideally with well-trained parameters for uh, from the super circuit. And then starting from those uh, or trained from scratch, you can find the final parameters for this candidate circuits um, as your final uh, parameterized quantum circuit design. Um, so uh, after this process, the important message is that the whole process needs to be just reliable enough to rank the candidate circuits, um, just enough to search for uh, a good performing candidate circuits that does well on a particular qubit mapping. So the searching process or the ranking process um, is done jointly with qubit mapping. Um, we, we call that a co-search method, um, but we'll come back to that. So it's important that you might ask, well, is this whole restricted sampling uh, uh, reliable uh, because if you are inheriting some of the parameters for super circuit um, when you compare the performance of each sub circuit you use the inherited parameter from a super circuit is the performance indicative of the final performance um, if if the parameters were trained from scratch and um, I want to show this, this nice plot showing that uh, you have a strong correlation of the performance with the inherited parameter from supercircuit with the final performance with parameters trained from scratch. Um, and uh, a, a common criticism for classical neural architecture search is that this, this, uh, this ranking can be uh, the variance of this ranking or the correlation might be too weak uh, to indicate any um, ranking. Um, uh, for the benefit of improving accuracy value, uh, marginally improving uh, accuracy in classical neural networks. Um, but I want to highlight that this is already a strong enough correlation to have a uh, a significant amount of improvement in finding a good subcircuit. Um, so, what I want to say is that if a subcircuit, if a sub, if a circuit candidate can improve the performance by, uh, say, twenty percent of uh, uh, prediction accuracy, um, this whole process uh, is worthwhile, and the ranking or the little noise from from this. Uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, variant variation in uh, inherited parameters is is tolerable. So um, uh, with that, I'm going to show that it works, the whole process, um, by showing how much improvement we can get just by adapting some of the circuits to, uh, to hardware from this uh, searching mechanism. So um, a very quick uh, go through of the benchmarks and devices that we use. Um, we tested these uh, mechanism on two type of tasks, classification in quantum machine learning, as well as a variational quantum eigen solver for various uh, molecules. Um, and, and they are 
deployed on quantum devices uh, publicly accessible from IBM Q, uh, ranging from 5 to 65 qubits with quantum volume 8 to 128. These are the uh, machine that we have today. Um, and uh, let's see how they perform. Um, but I want to say that our mechanism is orthogonal to the parameterized quantum circuit design space exploration, uh, where you define what are the basic blocks look like? Um, what does the structure look like? Uh, like convolutional quantum neural network. Uh, you, have, you have measurements and uh, adaptive measurements and uh, parameterized quantum gates. So these will all uh, uh, work nicely in, this, in, in our framework as long as you can uh, uh, input these design spaces as basic blocks for, for this search tool. And in our uh, analysis, we try to uh, cover as many as we uh, can um, in different styles of uh, parameterized quantum circuits and try to explore as large of circuit design space as possible and then search among those design space. Um, we want to demonstrate that uh, exhaustively search through the large design space is impossible, and we have enabled a efficient search mechanism for doing so. Now, to compare, we need to define our baselines. Um, uh, we want to compare with design that's unaware of noise or those designs that are manually crafted uh, to, to fit well for application or a uh, hardware efficient, uh, claimed hardware efficient um, on-site design. Um, we also want to uh, compare with uh, sort of uh, designs coupled with uh, circuit optimization, such as noise adaptive mapping available in IBM's software tool flow, um, et cetera. And we want to compare with them to see if our circuits perform better, our searched candidate circuit perform better. So uh, some of the results show that, uh, uh, for example, in quantum machine learning, if you are looking at uh, one of the tasks in one of the circuit design space uh, for MNIST 4 classification and using the uh, U3 and control U3 gate, on IBM Q Yorktown device, we can in fact see that our searched quantum circuits will have a really nice peak uh, at a larger number parameter uh, regime, meaning that with this noise adaptiveness, we can allow circuit with more parameters um, to reach higher accuracy. The, the accuracy gain is twofold. One is that more parameters may have more expressive power, um, but it's also more importantly because our circuit itself is, will protect the information that's transformed in parameterized quantum circuits. Um, because if we are comparing with the noise unaware search with that same number of parameters, you are seeing a, a huge increase in the in the uh, accuracy. So we want to highlight that noise adaptiveness uh, can contribute significantly and sometimes even more so than, uh, than the advantage allowed by expressive power of more parameters. So our tool nicely delays the peak to high uh, parameter regime. And uh, because we have a lot of thin space line and uh, many uh, uh, sort of a design space, it's a, it's a party going on here on this, on this plot. Um, so I want to highlight the average performance, which I am listing the numbers uh, in this table down below. Um, so we can see that for four classification, we can significantly improving, uh, improve the uh, at average accuracy uh, to uh, comparing to any manually designed or noise unaware design uh, circuit onset and with 
pruning, we can also marginally improve this, uh, uh, this accuracy, end-to-end -end accuracy, um, uh, just by reducing some of the gates. Uh, we can also see that uh, in two classifications, this whole story uh, is the same. And in fact, if you look at, this is the average case, but if you look at the uh, best case scenario, we can in fact accomplish 95% of accuracy uh, for two classification. Um, and note that this is a demonstration on quantum hardware. Um, so the inference and uh, is, is done on quantum hardware, noisy quantum hardware. This is not uh, the simulation results. Um, so uh, on the variational quantum ion solver, things are also very interesting. Um, if you have a theoretically very nicely performing on side design, like the unitary couple cluster single or double uh, UCCSD on side, um, it's not quite adaptive to the underlying hardware. Um, so naturally you will see this is not very well performing. Uh, in this case, in variational quantum eigen software, we want to target a uh, global minimum of the expectation value of the uh, objective function. Um, so lower is better on this plot. You can see that we can beat um, noise unaware uh, search design or any human design. Um, and when I say human design, these are the handcrafted circuit on start uh, using these uh, corresponding circuit uh, design space. Um, so across the board, we can see improvement in getting a, a lower value. Um, and we can see that it will work for other molecules on this algorithm as well. The uh, uh, benefit gain the improvement gain is uh, varying across devices as well as across um, the problem. So um, you can compare how well things perform for the same task, but on different hardware by looking at uh, uh, the results in different groups, uh, et cetera. So um, with that, I want to uh, mentioned a few words about the scalability of this whole process, and I have uh, skipped some of the technical details, so I want to cl clarify them. Um, the inference and training of the parameterized quantum circuits can be done in two different ways. The first one is um, always put into quantum machines. If you have a larger quantum machine, you will have the ability to, to do inference and training uh, of a larger circuit. Um, and you can use the parameter shift rule to, to measure um, uh, the gradient and uh, try to train the super circuit. Uh, we want to know that our mechanism is no harder than training a normal variational quantum circuit because the uh, training is done for super circuit once. Um, and the sub circuit is sampled from those super circuit inheriting the trained parameters. And one last step is to use a good performing sub-circuit and train the parameters for that single sub-circuit. So we are avoiding a lot of the uh, training for all circuit candidates using this mechanism. Um, and you can also do the inference and training on classical simulator. Um, the advantage of that is that the super-circuit training can be free of noise. So, um, uh, the benefit is that you can port that train the super circuit to different devices. Um, although the parameters are agnostic of the hardware noise. Um, so you have some trade off there. Um, and I want to say that the classical simulation mode of inference and training um, is not as bad in scaling as you might uh, think. Uh, because if you are using, um, say, tensor network simulation for the classical uh, simulation of the inference, we at every training step, we are altering a subset of the circuit. And uh, in this tensor network picture, you can think of this subset as a huge tensor, 
and the rest of the circuit is another tensor, and the computation in the rest of the circuit can be reused. Um, so it's not like a simulation of the entire uh, tuple circuit every iteration. Um, so overall, our tool can reduce the search cost and, um, and the, uh, the overhead of training all the candidates um, sub-circuits. So uh, it's also open source. Um, and you can use this implemented in PyTorch, um, including the simulator. Uh, and you can deploy to different hardware uh, very easily with Qiskit. Um, and we allow different modes of simulation. I call that static and dynamic. Static to represent the tensor network simulation and dynamic for the state vector simulation. Um, static and dynamic relative to uh, debugging, whether you can pause to see what the circuit looks like. Um, and, and we can see that the training speed is uh, um, accelerated compared to existing uh, software. Um, and we have particularly paid attention to how to speed that up for uh, classical hardware, like uh, CPU and GPU. Um, and uh, you can see significant in improvement if you use a static mode, which is the tensor network simulation. <clears throat> so uh, I also want to quickly wrap up by mentioning several related work that uh, came out in the past year or so, uh, roughly the same timeline uh, as this work. Um, and the method of neural architecture search for designing parameterized quantum circuits has, has uh, picked up its momentum. And there are several variants in, in designing this thing. And I think an important thing to look for is whether some of the techniques, components of the technique work well in the context of parameterized quantum circuits. And uh, in our case, this pruning works surprisingly well. I want to just highlight that uh, for one. So um, uh, uh, if you have a quantum circuit that you want to prune some, some gates off, um, you are, uh, as I mentioned, um, sort of, uh, uh, well, let me, let me maybe get back to, to uh, to that if, if there, there's more questions uh, in the interest of time. But uh, 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 I'll, I'll first motivate some of the outlook and then get back to there. Um, so um, a general method for parameterized quantum circuits uh, that we present here is to how to elastically grow or shrink the um, parameterized quantum circuits that can adapt to application and hardware. Um, having this tool, it will sort of uh, facilitate the design of the onsite construction. If you have a intuition of what kind of model may work well, and you want to deploy that on hardware, um, uh, we can help in exploring the adjacent design space and then find a appropriate quantum circuit model with the well-trained parameters for that circuit uh, to work well on a particular hardware. Um, and in particular, we are looking into how uh, this circuit will enable Baron Plateau uh, to be, uh, to be uh, absent. Um, uh, in particular, how do you rank the candidate circuits uh, in, in relative to the degree of uh, uh, sort of relative to how much barren plateau you observe. Um, we are also looking at how to combine the insights from different kernel methods uh, in designing better encoding and quantum prem and parameterized quantum circuits interleaved with the encoders uh, uh, to enable uh, good training gradient descent dynamics. For example, so um, uh, with that, yeah, I, I will uh, again acknowledge the team, and uh, this is a collaboration of uh, amazing collaboration between uh, 
among several institutions and uh, the implementation of the tool flow uh, is mostly uh, done by uh, collaborators in the first row. Um, and I also just want to uh, uh, plug for, uh, for, for my group here at Yale. Uh, we have open PhD positions here at uh, Yale CS if you're interested and if your interests align with the uh, kind of work that we talked about today. Uh, feel free to reach out. So with that, I'll say thank you all for attention and um, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Maybe I can uh, get us started. Um, for your noise aware compilation strategies, um, what noise models do you use? Yeah, so uh, as I motivated here, there are two ways that noise can be incorporated. Either quantum machines will inherently be noisy and you are performing inference and training on these hard, noisy hardware. So we don't even need to model these noises. You can just train your parameters in the presence of real hardware noise. Or we had do classical simulation with noise, noise models. And uh, to answer your question in the context of classical simulation, uh, we use the reported uh, noise model benchmark from uh, IBM machine. So uh, they report, for example, uh, probabilities for um, different uh, depolarizing channels and, and, and various crowds operators. And we can stimulate that with our noisy uh, circuit simulation. So, um, yeah. And, and does your, uh, when you simulate these, does your noise model take into account any difference between stochastic noise and unitary errors? Correct. So, uh, um, we have, uh, so I think in the current open source library, we have the state vector simulation mode uh, turned on, in which case unitary noise um, can be enabled so that you can keep as a state vector. Um, we're also trying to integrate the uh, density matrix simulation so that stochastic noise models can be uh, uh, integrated as well. So for the results that I shared, they are uh, inference and training on quantum hardware. Daniel? Hi, uh, I have a general question about the parameter shift rule. So um, in, in that model, I think we're just considering a pure uh, unitary circuit, but like we all know that with the presence of noise, it's far from the truth on today's hardware. So does that, does that rule still work for um, like um, the realistic, uh, like really? after we added the noise the model of uh, quantum computing? That's a really good question. Um, in fact, our assumption for the super circuit training uh, is that if you are uh, ignorant of noise, then we can just use the regular parameter shift rule uh, to derive your gradient. And that already works well. Uh, in fact, our results uh, for the super circuit um, using parameter shift rule is not uh, the gradient is not in the presence of noise, but I like to acknowledge that uh, uh, using parameter shift rule, exploring the possibility of using parameter shift rule, calculating the gradient in the presence of noise, will improve the training and uh, accuracy or performance of the super circuit and bring even more benefit to the system. Um, I have to acknowledge that that's not something that we have uh, integrated. Okay, uh, since no one uh, follow, I have a, a, some other questions. So um, you have this encoder uh, of images. So how do you know that um, 
two images won't like sort of collide after this encoder. Is there a proof? Okay. Yeah. No. There's no proof of this work. Uh, um, uh, I'd like to, in fact, uh, say that our tool ideally would uh, work well with a good encoder, in the sense that if you have an encoder and high influence of noise, it's more likely to collide than uh, our noise aware parameterized quantum circuits. Um, we don't have a, sort of a specific evidence of, um, um, we, we in fact have a, a evidence of this. And I don't have it on my slides, but uh, uh, we can see that after the noise um, aware optimization, um, and the encoded quantum states, in fact, will have measurement feature uh, uh, well separated or well better separated than, than without the noise aware uh, optimization. So if you have the same encoder uh, without noise, you will see that all the features, measured feature will cluster uh, due to very high influence of noise but uh, um, our tool naturally separates them. So this is only a sort of end-to-end -end, uh, evidence of uh, preserving those separation in encoder, uh, but not necessarily showing that our tool or prove that our tool will always do that. Um, um, I'd like to say that if you have some uh, uh, nice encoder and you want to empirically validate that they works well, then this tool will be useful. Okay, thanks for explaining. Uh, so yeah, I guess like you can always like replace like the first part in, in that uh, circuit diagram uh, you show uh, if you find a better solution. Uh, yeah. yeah. So like an encoder is basically just a function from the image space to uh, like the quantum state space. So like in, in this encoder, you use basically only the single cubic rotations, but like theoretically you can also use two cubic gates. Yes, and, and I understand that there are uh, theoretical work that's showing that uh, um, uh, what kind of encoder works well and others might not even have an advantage over classical uh, encoding. Um, so, uh, Again, as I claimed, this tool works orthogonal to encoder design, um, uh, but will facilitate encoder design. Bill, I'll ask another question. Um, in some okay. of your circuit diagrams, you showed what looked like uh, parameterized uh, controlled rotations. Um, uh, first part of this is, uh, did you actually use parameterized controlled rotations on IBM's devices? Um, and second, or did you decompose them in some way? And secondly, um, do you have a sense of um, like how, how the overall circuit onsots changes or like how, how, how responsive it is to changes in two qubit parameters versus single qubit parameters? Let me get to the first question. Uh, we decompose those uh, parameterized quantum uh, control uh, rotations. Here, I'm only showing the single qubit uh, uh, parameterized gates, the U3 gates on IBM machines, and the compiled gates varies. Uh, we are using off-the-shelf compilation from, their, uh, from the IBM tool. Um, and you can see if you prune away some of the parameters in their parameterized gates, you end up with a different number of compiled gates. So there is a additional level of optimization we can do is to prioritize on uh, pruning those parameters that will allow fewer gates uh, to, to improve the fidelity. Uh, and we can see that uh, different uh, pruning ratio, uh, in fact, will give you different accuracy gain. So uh, different tasks can have a different 
optimal ratio as well. Uh, remember the pruning was the iterative process. We can increase how much you prune off um, and uh, our tool will try to identify the optimal pruning ratio automatically. Can, could you uh, remind me the second question? I was just wondering if um, when you're computing gradients for um, angles in two qubit gates, I'm wondering if, if your circuit output or your accuracy is more responsive to changes in two qubit gates than it is to single qubit gates, just by the very nature of, of, of what they play in a circuit, or if, if it's roughly similar. Right. Uh... Like if, if you could optimize, if you could optimize training one over the other, is there a preference? Yeah, that's a really good question. We don't even have, we don't have a preference or a mechanism to detect the uh, prioritize on uh, optimizing these set of gates. But I think it will be definitely worthwhile to look at those. As I mentioned, I think in a similar vein, um, optimizing, prioritizing different ways to prune or prioritizing different qubits as shown in our uh, from sampling technique and a progressive shrinking technique, we're always prioritizing on training some of the parameters uh, will have benefits. Uh, but I think your suggestion would definitely worth looking at. And I'll follow up with another one. Um, have you considered or tried out different error mitigation strategies? both in the training of the parameters and or in the estimation of expectation values. And then Daniel, Daniel has a question after that. Okay, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned um, in the baselines, we are using some noise mitigation technique off the shelf from IBM. In particular, because we have this qubit mapping search mechanism uh, built in, we want to compare with existing noise adaptive mapping uh, 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 optimizations. Um, and, uh, and the results so I guess are- I'm thinking, I'm thinking more like IBM came out with, you know, their zero noise extrapolation or Richardson method. Have you tried something in, in that vein? Right, so, so that's uh, uh, in fact, a, follow-up work from there, we have a comparison of uh, how post-processing or digital noise mitigation techniques uh, compare um, and how to improve those so that they can integrate it into this framework. I didn't have the time to get into those, um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's exactly one of the things that we, are, uh, we have just explored and uh, continue to explore. Hey, Daniel. Yeah. Um, so I read the RoQ and paper a few days earlier, and uh, the biggest question I have is that you have this uh, like basic block, right? And you repeat it a few times, but like in the end, at every basic block, you measure all the qubits. Um, yes. Can you say it again? So like uh, in the end of every uh, basic block huh. of a uh, unitary circuit, you you have like. Uh, measurements on all the right. qubits. Right. So, yeah. yeah, so like that's something that I haven't seen because previously, you, if I think of a quantum neural network, it's just a whole big unitary and then you measure at the end. So, yeah, I wonder like, is there like any theory on like how would that uh, measurement in the middle work? Yeah. And also, I think that would make this circuit uh, way easier to simulate, right? Because after you measure, you just get a big probability distribution. Classic. Exactly. We can just pick the uh, circuit in, in, in between, um, treat them as a single circuit. Uh, so yeah, so this is precisely what this tool enables us to do. Uh, try to, to try to explore different ways of constructing this type of circuits. Um, we haven't seen a lot of the evidence, empirical evidence on how uh, having these in uh, measurements in between and re-uploading uh, the um, uh, data 
as well as the previous measured results um, into subsequent parameterized quantum circuit, how that kind of model will work. So that really is just uh, uh, trying to apply this mechanism to, to that type of uh, new model. Um, and uh, I have to say that I've seen theoretical results in looking at, uh, let me pull out this picture, where there are no measurements between the uh, layers of encoder and parameterized quantum circuits. Um, and in the high depth and, and wide regime, you can use the uh, quantum uh, tangent kernel to characterize the uh, behavior of gradient descent dynamics. Um, and, and it's really important that a take home message from the theoretical work is that maybe at some mild depth regime, we can have some uh, uh, really effective design, uh, expressive and trainable design. Uh, so things like that, we can always try out. Um, I have not seen too many uh, theoretical uh, uh, work in looking at uh, uh, these type of uh, design yet. Um, but uh, I think it's uh, active work um, in progress, um, like looking at the re-uploading of data as well as having measurements interleaved and so on. I think like if you measure like every basic block, um, then it's, then you, like you treat every basic block as like a, this pr uh, probability distribution on measurement, it's a random process, right? You have like n basic blocks, then you basically have um, n pro uh, like n step process. Um, but I also like, uh, like encoding this image first in the quantum states would be like different from uh, classical uh, approaches. Right, yeah. right. Um, and I want to say that the design of the encoder as well as the model, how do you construct different gates together uh, is not so well understood. So I think uh, uh, from theoretical perspective, like treating it as a distribution or uh, empirically just validating these radical models um, is a fruitful direction. Okay, um, great. So I think uh, we're going to switch over to the last phase of this. Um, we're gonna kick all the uh, faculty and, and uh, F professor is out of the room, except for you, Yongchun, um, yeah. and let the postdocs and students uh, have a private question and answer session. And uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Cal 